right. Aloha. Welcome, everybody, to our Slice of Piecast monthly seminar series. It looks like most people got some lunch, some pizza. Um, please feel free during the talk to go up and grab another slice, or if you haven't helped yourself, uh, uh, go ahead. Um, this is our November installment of our monthly Slice of Piecast uh, seminar, hosted by the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center. Uh, many of you are familiar with PyCast. Um, we might have some new folks on the line. So um, my folks of PyCast is we are a collaborative partnership between the U.S. Geological Survey and a university consortium hosted by the University of Hawaii at Manoa with the University of Hawaii at Hilo and the University of Guam designed to support sustainability and climate adaptation in communities across the Pacific Islands. I am Brad Romine. I'm the uh, deputy director on the university side, our university consortium of Pie Cask, working really closely with our U USGS partners. This monthly Slice of Pie Cask seminar series provides a platform for sharing state-of-the-art climate adaptation research and science to management applications in Hawaii, U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands, and beyond. These seminars are held on the first Tuesday of the month um, at noon, Hawaii time, here at UH Manoa and online throughout the fall and spring semesters. Uh, everybody's helped themselves some, to some lunch. Um, we will also have um, pie provided by Rachel again, a pumpkin pie this time. So pizza pies and pumpkin pie, keeping with our slice of pie cast uh, theme here. So thank you very much, Rachel, and um, for providing that pie and uh, to Kristen and Lisa for helping with the lunch as well. Um, so as you've already seen, I think this presentation is being recorded. It will be available on our PyCast website under news events um, in a few days. Uh, for those of you joining online, please do keep your microphones on mute. We will have time at the end of the question, um, or at the end of the presentation for questions. Um, so with that, it is my honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Rosie Anilani Allegato will be sharing with us today about her work on a practitioner-led approach to a climate change needs assessment of native Hawaiian aquaculture. Dr. Aligato is an associate professor of oceanography, directs Sea Grant's Ulana Ike Center of Excellence, and is an investigator with the Daniel K. Inouye Center for Microbi Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, or Seymour. Rosie centers a critical OEVI or Native Hawaiian perspective on research as practice, training scholars to draw upon multiple knowledge systems to address key problems and empower communities to understand and protect their resources. She uh, directs the Laboratory for Microbial Ecology and Evolution. And help me, how do you pronounce the acronym there? Me'e. Me'e. Okay, thank you, Rosie. <clears throat> um, the Me'e Lab which applies contemporary and OEV methodologies within a One Health framework to understand co-evolutionary processes influencing the microbiomes of indigenous seascapes. Rosie is an advocate for indigenous data sovereignty and co-developed Kulan and OE, a process for building and sustaining equitable relationships between researchers and communities. Rosie earned a BS in biology from MIT a PhD in microbiology and immunology from Stanford and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at UC Berkeley. Wow. Uh, Rosie is also distinguished by her extensive professional service to the university and community, which includes serving as co-director of the Miley Mentoring Bridge, a near peer mentoring program for undergraduates transitioning from community colleges to UH Manoa. Rosie is also the chair of the city and county of Honolulu Climate Change Commission, which we proudly serve together. Um, but we're, we're okay at their sunshine. We are, as long as nobody else from the commission shows up today. Right? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Rosie is also a member of the NASM Ocean Sciences Board and uh, the U U.S. National Committee for the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Thank you very much. Mahalo, Noe, for being Mahalo. here today, Rosie. I'm going to pass it to you. Go ahead. Mahalo. Thank you. Okay. Right. Okay, I just want to check before I get started. You guys can see a black screen on Zoom. Yeah, okay. O Luisa Oi Wong Kong, no way he maui. No ho ya Daniel Hamuaho Kalona McGregor, no Kalua Nui. Hana o Daniel Hamuaho Elua, he pula pula. O Daniel Hamuaho Mai Kalua Nui, no ho ya Louise, sorry, no ho ya Anita Valerie Branco, no la Hawaii. Hanao o Diviana Pomaika Imagregor, Hipula Pula. 
O Daviana, Homai Kaima Gregor, no Kaibi Ula Kapala Moahu, no Ho Yadin Tibor Show Aligaro, no San Narciso Zambales, Philippines. Hanao O, Rosie Anolani, He Pula Pula. O Waya Lee, Ku Pula Ivi, O Ahui Manu Kahalu Ku Aina, O Kaua Po Ai Hale Ku Uvai, O Ma Eli Eli Ku Uku, O La Loa, Mahalo. So um, I started off with my mo'oko hao, which in in kind of folding in who my ancestors are, as well as the lands that they come from, is in and of itself a land acknowledgement. So um, I hope that was okay for you all. And um, I am very privileged to practice science and do my work on the lands of my ancestors. And just wanted to share that my lived experiences really, um, <clears throat> really frame and foreground my work. So today I'm going to be talking big picture on the future and history of local adaptation. And I in no way kind of, um, this work is not done in isolation. So I want to recognize um, the team of other um, folks that have worked with me on this. So Katie Hinson, Brenda Asuncion, Mima Samanaha, and of course the Hui Malama Loko Ia are the ones who really helped us to put this together. This image comes from the 2018 meeting that um, where we where we were able one of the major meetings where we all came together and um, kind of put together the report that I'm going to talk to you about today. So this is us at Kahina Pohaku really coming together and building the wall up. And what is so amazing is that this was a gathering of about a hundred practitioners as well as researchers as well as community partners. So just to kind of give us some background. I wanted to talk about general ideas of resource management and sustainability and resilience, Makavakahiko. In other words, prior to contact or um, 1778. So um, in Kavakahiko, people actually fished more than they do, not less. So I'm, I wanna start off with kind of a broad picture of protein in Hawaii. Um, we know that Native Hawaiians caught about 50% more fish than modern fleets catch today in both Hawaii um, and as we compare that to the Florida Keys, the study comes from um, something that Jack Kinninger um, put out um, about 10 years now. And we know that um, from estimates, um, from historical ecology data, that Hawaiians harvested about 15 metric tons of fish per square kilometer annually um, from 1400 to 1800. How were they able to create and pull that much protein off of the reefs? That's five times the median harvest in island nations today. So I would say that one of the major things that they did was to exercise really, really um, appropriate, place appropriate and robust um, mechanisms, policy mechanisms. We might call them different words. We might use the word kapu system, but I like to think of them as policy mechanisms. And when we compare what actually they did, it's very similar to the mechanisms of management that we teach, that we that we that we use and implement today. So again, all of these you might see and use the word if you're from Hawaii, you might use the word. These are just kapu, but they were wielded and used um, very very specifically. So they had temporary or permanent bans on specific um, target species and for location. So that, that was a temporal aspect that they utilized. They utilized spatial restrictions of put, letting certain areas rest. Um, they had restrictions on certain species based on their life history of whether or not they were spawning. Um, there was guidances on gear of what was appropriate to use where, and there were also catch limits. And I would say to this, this is really the wild catch aspect of it. There was also the very much um, more aquaculture or mariculture, but I just wanted to kind of um, really, really emphasize that. So this mo'olelo or this story of ku'ulakai plays a very important role. We know that the amount of fish that was taken on off of the reef is most almost certainly connected to an additional innovation, technological innovation that happened at least a millennia ago. So I want to feature to you here. This is actually a picture from my children's storybook about Kuulakai. So um, Ku is one of the four major deities in Hawaiian society and is actually a pretty large deity across Polynesia and the Pacific. So <clears throat> Many of people associate him with being, quote unquote, a god of war, but he's very much, Ku is very much about um, the human element, 
um, in natural systems. So Ku had a supernatural understanding of fish. Some might say he was like the best marine biologist, best ecosystem, probably also was an amazing, you know, physical oceanographer because he knew where the fish would be, when to fish. And into that, what's really interesting about this Mo'olelo is despite his amazing knowledge of just being able to naturally be a great fisherman. And so in fact, he is the Akua of fishermen in general. He, there is a story of who as a man being a head fisherman during a time of famine. And what I think is so interesting about this Mo'olelo is he was the head fisherman during a time of, of famine on Maui. And we don't know, the Mo'olelos don't tell us whether or not that famine was caused by a natural catastrophe or whether or not it was caused by human error and hubris. Um, we don't even know if it was a famine that was on the land or on the sea, right? Um, so it could be due to overfishing or there was a problem though, and it did have to do with the fish. And what he did was he utilized his knowledge of the ocean, of um, terrestrial inputs into the near shore in order to invent. And really, this is one of the capstones of Hawaiian society and technology is this little structure we're looking at here called the local ia. It is different from weirs or fish traps that you might see across the Pacific because of this little um, wooden structure here that if you take a look at the pie, you will also see that Rachel made called the makaha. <clears throat> And that makaha, that structure, which really is more than just trapping fish, but going the next level and raising fish is what um, really makes Hawaiian culture and society, um, it, it was the ground, it was really the ground, the, the foundations for that. So he built the first fish pond at the confluence of stream and ocean um, and was able to entrain um, land-based nutrients in order to not really feed fish, but to actually boost primary production or boost photosynthesis. And the power behind that is that when he was able to capture this, and then we, we call it in other courses, beneficial eutrophication. It's very rare. Usually you hear the word eutrophication and it's bad, but this was an intentional beneficial eutrophication where you now have steady states of nutrients to supply and continually kick off phytoplankton growth. And this enabled cultivation of fish all year round. And that's a very, very different thing than going out into the reef, knowing their natural cycles, because now you've turned into a fish farmer from a fish kind of like extractor. Um, and so the reason why fish ponds now take this really important place in our society, and even today, I think, is because fish ponds are very much an innovation of necessity. That, so when you go to a fish pond, please don't only think like, wow, this fed a lot of people. Please think this was an invention that came out of hardship. And I think that that's really something, it's an, it's, it's an invention that came out of adaptation. And over the next centuries, fish ponds continued to adapt and evolve. I'm not gonna show you a picture, but we know that there were at least six types of fish ponds that were adapted to the Hawaiian environment, to the very, very you know different coastal environments. <clears throat> And that by the time we got to Cook in 1778, we know that there are approximately, this is by LIDAR and, um, our, you know, ag, um, um, yeah, LIDAR and other kinds of studies, we know that there are at least 450 fish ponds across the Hawaiian Islands. So this became something that was really spread all over the place. This in concert with flooded agroecosystems or lo'ikalo, and the Konohiki system, which is another way to think about the Ahupua'a system. When I use the word Konohiki, I'm really referring to um, the management of that system. So Konohiki are the head men or head women of these Ahupua'a or these units that are organized from ridge to reef. Um, the Konohiki is the person who is in charge of knowing all of the resources there. This system allowed for higher sustained harvest because it relied very, very heavily on local intimate knowledge of those resources. And importantly, it was not divorced. So natural resource management was not divorced from community norms and responsibilities, which I think is also something that's slightly different today. Um, this is just a very simple slide. I had actually made like three slides and then I was like, all of these slides 
can be distilled just down to this, that over time there were shifting circumstances. Um, the easiest way to call it is social political changes, tons. There were shifts in the population. And when I say population, I mean the demographics of who was in Hawaii, but also what happened to Native Hawaiian populations, right? We, they were, we were decimated. And I use the word decimated literally, right? Like decimated comes from the Greek word deci, right? Which means one tenth. And, and infectious disease really did take the Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian population down one tenth. And that had a dramatic shift on who was working the land and the oceans, who were managing these spaces. And then also the political economies, right? We switched from very much a subsistence economy into a plantation agrarian economy. And then now, of course, we are in much more of a tourism and also military economy. And then of course, we have the, the, the kind of like overcast of uh, Western ideas of land ownership. So all of these simply put as shifting circumstances have resulted in a dramatic change in our natural resources today in Hawaii. Um, and so what we wanted to talk about is that in when we talk about climate change, also writ large, when we look at climate change assessments and people doing these assessments of practitioners or of areas, those oftentimes are external actors who are coming in. So it's a very top-down process. And when we conceived of the idea of, of thinking about um, a, a needs assessment for local EA practitioners, we really did this because we were going back to our ancestral thinking of local EA as the products as, of adaptive decision-making. And so we thought these were inventions of hardship and adaptation and resilience. They're symbols of resilience. We have climate change coming. All you have to do is say the word sea level rise and you're like, are there still gonna be fish ponds? And so we thought these are sites where, what you know, let's go back to the practitioners and ask them, what have you been observing? Um, what are some of the major management decisions and priorities that are really, really important to you? And how can we optimize what you have been out here seeing and changing, where, where are you going and what other additional knowledge do you need? And can that be a way for us to guide research and policy? So instead of research and policy guiding what's going on on the ground, can we have the opposite? Um, and that really challenges a lot of the notions of kind of Western policy making. So, you know, just to wanna acknowledge that Kia'i Loko have really adapted to climate shifts over many centuries. And when we look at this, this is really accumulated observation and knowledge, which is really different than when we think about scientists and researchers who oftentimes are going out for a set period of time and taking observations. So it's a very different way of, of kind of like accruing and aggregating knowledge. And, um, also recognizing just that contemporary human-induced climate change is just super unprecedented in their scope. And are these beautiful structures, what's going to happen to them? We partnered with the Hui Malama Loko Ia, which is a collective. It's the largest collective of fish pond practitioners across the state of Hawaii. This map illustrates how extensive the network is across all of the islands. There are practitioners on every single island. You will notice there isn't one on Koho'olawe. Actually, Koho'olawe is the only island where there isn't a fish pond, probably because it has such rich ocean resources, there's no need to make a fish pond. Um, but yeah, so we have, we have partners from across the state. And so what this um, bringing together this collective in and of itself is also um, a mechanism for resilience because um, in recent generations through collective action and knowledge sharing and support, that's another way for um, practitioners to really be able to adapt to change. Okay, so these are the project objectives that we have. We really wanted to facilitate and synthesize um, the research and needs gaps for local EA. But our approach was not to talk to other researchers. <laughs> our approach was to document um, and bring together the experts in this space, which are the Kia'i local, the, the guardians of these fish ponds, and to document and perpetuate their traditional ecological knowledge related to local EA. We were also very interested in growing um, partnerships and collaborations. So this was really the first step because we thought Oftentimes, uh, researchers are really interested in what can we do, you know, maybe they might have their own initially plans, but, you know, 
the, all the many of the researchers that I've worked with have always been open to oh, what are what are the needs that you want, and sometimes those are not well articulated. So we thought by creating this needs assessment, it would also serve as a starting point for um, dialogue um, around new research that could happen and new collaborations. And of course, we also wanted to improve communication and grow these relationships. So. <clears throat> which is this, the, this group, one thing that's very powerful, as I said, they have a lot of collective sharing. They get together um, annually. So they have an all hui gathering, which is everybody from, you know, all of the workers and all the staff. But they also have annually what are called po'o meetings, which are when just the directors or the heads, po'o means head, when the just like kind of like the executive committee um, kind of gets together. And so we wanted to kind of utilize already their working infrastructure. We didn't want them to have to like get together an extra time. And so our team um, really kind of created, um, set up our study so that we could um, adapt to the ways that they really already do that. And so they have these gatherings. It had not yet been directed to a specific focus. And um, what we did was we en endeavored to produce the first comprehensive compilation of the research ideas uh, within all of these folks. Okay, so I'm gonna get a little just methodological because I think it's good to talk about how we did it. Um, so we decided to um, conduct what we call an interpretive thematic analysis and um, using the notes that we took from the gathering. So this is a picture of um, one of the conversations that happened in 2019. So we had three different meetings. We met with them in 2018, a meeting of Po'o from 30 local ia. We had a hundred, over a hundred kia'i loko on Moloka'i. And then we had a concluding session with the heads in 2019 that really focused on um, ideating key edicts or key kapu and kanavai, like sacred things, restrictions, as well as laws that were to have come out of this. So this is a, this is, this captures just how big that gathering was. And um, as you can see, we posed different questions um, based on the framework that was important to them. And I just realized I should have put the framework before this slide. So I'm going to show you the framework after this. So they had already articulated a framework that they wanted to use. And we decided we're just going to go with their framework. So we didn't want to introduce anything, tell them how to do it. They had already prioritized um, the way that they think of their work. And so they're gathering. You can see we're taking notes. And so we did a, um, as I said, a thematic analysis of our raw notes. And then we just we assigned each of our data to six focus areas that had been developed frequently and previously. And then we compiled the notes within each focus area. We generated codes so that we could, you know, kind of um, reduce bias as much as we could. And then we selected key themes that we collectively evaluated and reorganized. Okay, so I want to share um, some perspectives on why is it important to, to I just want to drive this home of why is it important to start here, as opposed to start with the policymakers and move stuff down. Um, these are quotes from external sources, but a lot of them are indigenous voices. So Kyle Powis White um, really kind of emphasizes that the, um, what does it mean to adapt? You know, when we have these conversations, this is kind of, in the design of it, we we were really we I was actually really scared to 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 be honest. You know, I I thought we were going to go in and have these really difficult conversations about like what is it going to mean when your local eat it doesn't exist anymore. Um, you know, I was really bringing in this. I was really really nervous, right? What does it mean to be resilient? Um, and and what does it mean? You know, we think of climate change as a wicked problem, but I was very very surprised that this is not how. Um, the local e of practitioners um, took this. So it is really actually about respecting the system of responsibilities. That's what we, that's what I learned. I thought we were going to go in and we were going to talk about, we got to build the wall higher. Um, I'm worried about like the sea level open. No, it was all about systems of responsibility. So it was a much more um, holistic discussion that we had. It was about creative and inclusive research practices, about sharing knowledge and understanding. Um, and it was really about re-emphasizing when we had these climate change conversations, it was about um, the relationship between food and people, 
um, being tied to the cultural, physical, and emotional health of these communities. And so um, that's what we were really ended up, that's what we really, the conversations ended up being about. It wasn't about, you know, like I said, coral bleaching, or it was, it was very much about how are we going to continue to feed each other and create connection between people. And um, it really also was about spirituality, linking the seen and the unseen, the past, the present, and the future. And so it was very much about bringing the stories from the past. Like I told you the story of Kuula, it was about finding more stories that really helped um, to tell what happens when, when local ER are under pressure. So this is the framework that the local, the Hui Malama local ia uh, created. And as you can see, I'm gonna walk you through it because there are six parts of it. And they created this in order to be able to talk about all the things about climate change that are important to them. So the first thing that I'm gonna show you is, let's just talk about like what we see. So you see something that looks like a fish pond wall, right? So you see the stones and you see that there's more than one, there's actually two. Okay, so you see that there's fish ponds and that's important because it's just not one fish pond. So the idea here that was important was they wanted to create, this is their articulation. They wanted to create and make sure that the knowledge that we have upon fish ponds is not just for one fish pond, it's for more than one. Um, it's about the fish. It's, that is, that's like pretty much the most granular that we talked about was it's about making sure that the food stock can still come into the fish pond. Then you might not see this, but not clearly, but this is a bird's eye view. And these are people who are holding hands around the fish pond, okay? And they envision that as education. And so for each fish pond, they see that as critically important to create that community that's based in education around the, the changes that they see in the climate. And then you can see that there's there's a there's a kind of greater, like a universal Venn diagram. It's like a Hawaiian Venn diagram of who we sharing so that you know a fish pond in one area might be seeing things or looking at other things that the other fish pond might not have. And so they're saying it's really important that we have communication because even though climate change is regional and we might be seeing things differently, it's still important for us to share what we are seeing because perhaps that change might be something that our pond isn't affected by yet. So and then so they want to do inter hui sharing and then also recognizing we are one giant collective. Hey, hui ho okahi. And at the very base of that is loi novello. And loi novello is our ancestral knowledge. So, so I think it's really interesting because, you know, you don't see sea level rise here. You don't see uh, coral bleaching. You don't see ocean warming. You really see the reinforcement of relationships. So I thought that that was, that was like, so interesting that it's like the cultural foundation, the ho'ala ho is the reawakening. Sorry, I did skip that. That is the restoration piece. So it's a commitment to, they're gonna continue to restore and readapt. So they're not gonna just like, we build the fish pond and then we're just gonna build the fish pond wall higher. The, the, the information that we got back was, we might just move the whole fish pond. We might just move the whole thing back. And it was so much more flexible than I, I had even conceived of. It was really, really crazy to me with some of the conversations. So I wanna kind of go through with you. This is like the dirty, this is like a much neater version of our crazy notes. It was like so much chart paper, like so much chart paper. So um, I'm just gonna take, for example, um, the ho'alaho and the ia. So reawakening the physical loko ia. So that's their idea of restoration. That's how they conceive of it as we're gonna reawaken it. Um, so they were very interested in restoration economics, technical skills and expertise. And this was really great because it wasn't just, you know, um, indigenous already their um, expertise. There was a recognition that we have to bring knowledge from outside and incorporate that and utilize that. Um, thinking about upstream restoration was really huge. This recognition that it is an ahupua system that we can't just think of the local ia in isolation. We have to see what's going on, particularly with fresh water is a super important aspect of local ia health. Um, and thinking about that through climate change, invasive species and how those are gonna change. Um, and then the ia, which I thought was really interesting is they were very much wanting to establish 
systems to monitor what's going on. And particularly, we're very interested in changing patterns of natural recruitment. How can local EA really serve as hatcheries? We actually did talk about that a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, just the word hatchery carries a lot of baggage if you know anything about salmon hatcheries um, in the Pacific Northwest. But the idea of can, if the reefs are kind of being um, kind of not as productive as they used to be, what if we really kind of change what the function of local EA are to even function as hatcheries for this near shore reef. So I thought that was a very, it was a very big switch in, in, in terms of the thinking of, of how local EA might be used. How do we protect fish abundance and maintain ecological integrity? Um, and everybody recognized that primary productivity, which is um, articulated as limu, which is macroalgae, but it's also microalgae, um, phytoplankton, how do we do that? And so you can see some of the other, um, um, ideas that that they that they came up with. Um, so there's a lot of conversation. Um, the report is available as a PDF, which I'm going to share the um, QR code. But it is also held as a living format. The idea that this is not what we're going to use forever, and it's just that's the way it's going to be. But we can keep updating it. Okay. So I'm going to give some internal reflections and then some external reflections. So. Um, just the idea that this was a multi-year process. Our team, in order to go in and, and be able to build that trust, it took a long time for us to be able to create that um, environment of trust so that we could have that knowledge sharing. It was already happening um, in the Hui Malama local ia, but for everybody to trust that we would come into that space and um, kind of they would share their ideas with us, that took a long time but it was worth it. It was definitely slow science. Um, I think an important aspect of this that really um, allowed this to move forward, it, I know it sounds like it was a long time, but it, it actually was short in the, in the span, lifespan of, of these local EAs. What was critical was that we did not impose a framework. We applied a framework that they themselves um, created in developing and assessing their needs. And then um, there was really this idea that we are going to, thrive through these changes. It was it, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of times when I'm on the Climate Change Commission, I'll just put on my Climate Change Commissioner hat now. Um, there's a lot of climate anxiety and a lot of negativity. And I thought that was what we were going to experience here. I thought it was going to be a lot of kaumaha or sadness, but no, it was in fact the idea that there was this really sense of like our ancestors were able to, you know, change and we're going to thrive through these changes. It's going to require a holistic approach and it's going to require every aspect of our community of people um, to do it. And so it was like actually so positive and inspirational. So I just wanted that was like one of the reflections. And then just as a synthesis of how this compares to other um, climate needs assessments that I've seen. And with my hat on, um, generally just want to emphasize that climate assessments apply external frameworks and bring in actually external partner um, experts to define the issues that are relevant for adaptation. And what was so um, different about this is that here we centered existing priority frameworks, um, and that really departs from the conventional Western boundaries um, that's conceptualized by policymakers and researchers. Okay. Um, and so with that, I just kind of want to thank you. I, 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 Katie, I think, is, has gone to like get the actual report. Um, but in the meantime, if you wanted to look at it, it's a very lengthy report. Like it's very, very lengthy because one of the things was that the, the practitioners wanted to talk on generational levels. So this is a multi-generational report and it's not short. I, I, you don't want me to be like sum, like summating all of the things, but this is the QR code um, if you're interested. And um, Myself and I'll also throw Katie under the bus are, are are here to answer your questions. So thank you. Okay, mahalo, Rosie. We have uh, time for questions. <laughs> We're eating. <laughs> and discussion. Um, I see one in the chat. <laughs> Thanks. I can see it. Okay. Yeah, I see one in the chat already. Um, I can read it out. It's from uh, Judith. Um, we'll go back to the room in a moment to see if there's any questions here. Um, in the slide, 
Lomino Velo um, with the two fish uh, mm -hmm. Could the education frame by people be taken literally? Oh yeah. Yeah. Could we put a structure that allows people to interact with the fish pond? Oh, totally. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think for sure the idea here is it's not just the fish pond practitioners here. This is like children. This is like adults, kupuna. Yes, I would say it's literal, not just kind of like me metaphoric for the interactions, for sure. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's go to the room. Any, any questions, comments in the room? There are microphones sort of dispersed about, so if you can ask a question. <laughs> Yeah, they're sitting on some of the chairs there. Hi. Hi. Such an thing. And positive uh, presentation. I loved it. Uh, my question is um, a lot of times, adaptation, you know, the burdens of. Uh, oh, the are there any um, issues or discuss it, discussions about financing, um, you know, practical? Yes, absolutely. So um, I think the economics or the financing of it is a really interesting question um, because let me kind of think about this. There's, there's can local EO themselves be a self-sustaining kind of like economy or business, mm -hmm. right? That could, that could, you know, in some, some ways decrease our dependence, you know, increase our food sovereignty. Um, and so that's like one aspect of it. And then there's also, I think what you're asking is like, as we adapt to climate change, like independent of whether or not it's a successful um, activity, um, is there funding for, I just want to understand your question. Is there funding for that aspect? Is that what you're kind of thinking about? Okay, so um, I would say, well, first of all, I'll ask Katie if there's anything that you wanted to add to, to that or. No. <laughs> okay. I would say, I would say that's, that's a huge question. Um, the good thing about it is that recently, um, you know, there have been more federal funds that are turning to this. Um, one in particular is something that Sea Grant is involved in. I'm blanking on what NOFO stands for, Katie. What does it stand for? Or Brad? Like oh, yeah, yeah, not the NOFO. I call it the NOFO, but it's it's this, um, I'm talking about the big, the NOFO regional. regional. Yeah, regional, I get mixed up. Regional Community Resilience Challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is, you know, these communities have been pushing for a really long time to say, hey, fund this work. Because, you know, not only is there a challenge, but I think we're beginning to see, you know, you might call it nature-based solutions, but I think we're beginning to see that Indigenous peoples are protecting about 80% of the biodiversity on this earth. And biodiversity is really key for resilience. So, you know, how can we support these Indigenous kind of efforts to, you know, steward Mother Earth? And so NOAA has put out a really huge grant. Um, and I think the way that we are conceiving it here at Sea Grant, but I don't want to talk for Brad and Katie, um, is really centering, trying to also center indigenous communities and center community partners in funding that. So I do think that there is responsibility, I guess is what I'm saying, on the part of governments um, to fund communities in this way. Um, There's something else that I've that I was that I've been thinking about, um, but I can't remember right now, but I'm hoping maybe if, if anybody else, if Katie has anything to add to that, I can remember what I was going to say. I mean, I guess I'll say that one of the reasons that we keep... Oh, I have to talk into this thing. Okay. Sorry. One of the reasons that um, when we were talking with the coordinator, Brenda Asuncion from Hui Malama Local EO, oh. one of the reasons they were interested in producing a document like this is that they often have requests from researchers, from funders, from other entities saying like, what do fish ponds need? And so having an articulation of the kinds of needs and interests from the Kia'i local on the ground in a document that is maybe going to be respected or understood by more Western institutions was valuable from them and for them. And what I took away from it is that for many of the fish ponds, like if we had gone to these meetings and said, like, what do you need to adapt to climate change? We wouldn't have gotten this kind of list, we wouldn't have gotten this kind of response. But instead we kind of came in and said like, you've been having conversations amongst yourselves about what are the collective activities and 
things you can put your energy towards for many years. And we sort of framed the conversation around that stuff. And so we got things like we need more school buses so that kids can visit the ponds and value the spaces and grow up understanding them. And we wouldn't have gotten that if we said like, what do you need for climate change? And so broadly, I think having like a much bigger definition of what we consider to be resilience activities or climate adaptation activities is something that I would like to see come out of projects yeah. like this. That's right. I think that's right. I think I think I think what that is is that there's a holistic nature to the needs and by articulating this report it's exactly as you said when funding opportunities come up um the communities already have something that they can readily like kind of utilize and put it forth. But you're absolutely right that funder funding is a huge is a huge question. Yeah, Katie say more. Yes, come on. You're coming. Yes. Uh, maybe I think we can move to another question. We could totally do like climate reparations around this. Like that'd be cool, you know. Just, okay. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Um, I see one in the chat. Let's go to the chat real quick. And we'll come back to Maya and the rest of the room. Um, okay. Uh, this comes from uh, Michelle Feller. Um, Would it be possible to place a temporary fish pond outside of the permanent fish ponds in order to improve health Ooh. of corals at risk? So um, I guess what I would say is, that would be really difficult because a temporary fish pond is one that is has a physical constructed nature about it. Um, and if we were to build it in a in in the way that we would to align and be consistent with traditional practices, it would require a ton of labor and materials. So I would say a temporary fish pond, perhaps not, but you know, there are other mechanisms like CBFSAs, community-based subsistence fisheries, which can utilize or you know, um not a CBFSA, but like Ka'upulehu um, has utilized through their community um, governance models, um, ways to increase the abundance of fish um, through that way. So that would, you know, not necessarily building a temporary fish pond and then taking it down, but you can just enforce policies, I think, that that would that can alter people's behavior. Great, I see. And follow that. <laughs> there was a couple suggestions uh, kind of in follow up to that question about maybe bubbles is a barrier, a bubble, bubble fence, I guess. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. I, like I don't camera know systems like monitoring. Yeah. Um, yes. So, so we have used cameras to look at fish going in and out of the fish pond for sure. Um, we haven't done it in any way to look at like counts, fish counts. Um, I think probably the most effective for that would be like a, a tag system, a mark recapture system, which has been done for predators, but we haven't done it for the target fish. Um, but certainly um, we do see an increase in fish recruitment in fish ponds that have been restored, like at Heia Fish Pond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, questions that are still coming in the chat and I, I do wanna welcome folks um, online to, uh, Come off mute too if you have questions, but let's go to the roof right now. I know Maya, you had a question, right? Go ahead. Hello, thank you for your talk. It was so cool. Mm -hmm. My question is, do you think the current resilience and adaptation funding landscape supports the types of holistic approaches identified through this process? <sighs> and if not, how do funders need to change? I would say no, and then possibly yes. Okay, so um, I'll let Katie answer her opinions on the no. I think possibly <laughs> yes, in that there are new funding mechanisms that the federal government has put out. Um, one of them is called BRICS, and I'm now blanking on what BRICS stands for. Do you remember? I just remember the acronym is Building BRICS. Resilience or something. Yeah, uh, Building Resilience. And so communities can actually apply for these funds as opposed to just municipal entities. That's really powerful. One in particular community that is going after this is the Ha'ula community. So if if you, I, mean, I will say there's a lot of challenge, like it's, it, there's a lot of challenges to creating to be able to go after those funding is very similar to the challenges for CBFSA. For example, what I mean by that is you need to have a really strong community who's all on the same page. Can we think of a community in Hawaii where that is always the case? No, I mean, communities are not monolithic, but you need to have strong communities with strong leadership. You ideally would have a plan that community, that the different communities would be, that one community would be supportive of. If you have all of those ingredients in place, it could be in better shape. There's also a huge um, burden in terms of administration of these grants, right? So communities 
have a really hard time kind of be, being able to meet the administrative requirements for these funds, which are big money and could really make a huge difference. So I would say there are funds available, but there are significant challenges and barriers to being able to effectively get and manage those funds. Having said that, I don't think that that should bar communities. And I think what it really says is that um, it, it calls to the need of what I would call boundary organizations, which are organizations that can span um, different interfaces. Um, I don't know that I would call Sea Grant one, but I would definitely call maybe like Kua Aina Ulu Awamo, which is a nonprofit that is really helped communities to um, kind of have collect more collective strength and power um, towards making these kinds of laws and changes. So the existence of these and uh, these other organizations to like help with the administrative burden and help with kind of what it takes to run and manage these large grants is really what I think is needed. But Katie, what else? Boy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready to answer this question as, as honestly as I would like to answer it. Um, I think that we are largely still exploring solutions to climate change that are within economic and political systems that have created the problem. Mm -hmm. Good point. And I don't think we have quite, yeah, figured out how to move outside of that framework. And maybe we'll get to solutions within that framework, but there's some obstacles there. Yeah. I mean, there's the there's the government funding space, and then there's also the private, um, you know, um, phil philanthropic funding space, which is also quite large. But there are also issues with that too. Again, there's similar issues like, do you need to have, be a five hundred one three C? You have to incorporate ourselves. Like all of that is like, do we really want to do that? You know, how does that change our flexibility as a as a community if we need to do something like that? Mm -hmm. um, it requires a really functional community, which can be super challenging, especially in Hawaii where lineal descendants may need to leave because of cost of living, but they still may have kuleana to those places. So, you know, um, questions of membership, who is inside, who is outside is really complex and who can be part of this community mm -hmm. to make these decisions. Great, I see a couple more questions in the chat. We can go to those again. Um, Looks like there are corals overlapping with the walls of the fish pond. Is there sometimes a direct physical connection between fish pond and the coral reef? Yes. Um, in the case of Heia, for example, but many other places, I mean, Hawaii has like a fringing reef and oftentimes um, fish ponds were built right on top of the fringing reef to, to enclose that. So absolutely, yes. Okay, next question. Now you can see them. I'll go ahead and read it anyway. <laughs> so for the audience, um, it's from... Kirsten Olson, um, terrific work, and the report is a great resource. How do you see researchers using the needs assessment to support specific fish ponds? Right, so I think oftentimes when researchers wanna help and go into communities, they themselves might be like, how can we help you? Similar to um, what Katie said in the case of funders, right? Like, how can we help you? Uh, the goal is for this document to serve as a starting point for dialogue of saying, okay, you noted that you're really interested in how, to, you know, in fish recruitment and maintaining seed stock and, you know, what are the target species and what do you know about the life history and can my research inform and support that? Um, you might be seeing baseline. What is your baseline? Can we think about modeling and projecting for the future? And you know, are there different scenarios of management under which we can like help you project how your stock might change? So these are just, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking very in my own world of what I'm <laughs> of the research that I'm that I currently do, but but I feel like it's very useful for that. There are a lot of social economic questions as well um, that have to do with you could see fish ponds as an economy that we want to support, and how is it viable? Is it viable under new climate change scenarios? And so one might come in from a social scientist perspective and look at that. One could look at the impact of you know um, runoff. Um, you know, there are many land use changes, development. There's many, many different ways I think this document could be used um, to stimulate and serve as a nuclear for new research projects. Yeah, and I guess I would just add that um, the scale of this assessment is across the Hui Malama Loko Ia. So there might be elements of this that are not applicable to every pond, but if you as a researcher have a long running relationship with a fish pond, you can help them in conducting their own version of this process in articulating kind of the questions and the needs that they have. Mm -hmm. And that can be helpful if they are interested in engaging with 
academic researchers and being able to direct them in ways that are the most useful to the pond's kind of long-term goals. Mm -hmm. Great. Yep. Any other questions in the room? Yeah, I see a couple more questions in the room. Um, go ahead. I'm not sure who was first. Okay. All right. Um, so I had a question about um, hatcheries as a function of the local EO. Um, how exactly would implementing it work within the conf or within like the framework of indigenous practices? Go, Katie. So. And I think there were a couple different conversations around hatcheries, but the the understanding that I had um, is that there have been there has been conversation for a very long time with local Ia and many others across the state about potentially developing a hatchery that would help support fish ponds because there's no longer the level of like juvenile recruitment from the reefs that there were in days when um, the marine ecosystem was a bit more abundant. One thing that's been exciting, we have like another project that we work on different from this, but it's this aquaculture collaborative across the Pacific region. So seeing other indigenous communities, tribal communities in um, the West Coast of like the continental North America, mostly British Columbia and Washington that run their own hatcheries has been really interesting to see. And I think there are folks within Hui Malama Loko Ia that are, are, would like to learn kind of from their example um, and run an actual hatchery, hatchery, but in a way that is consistent with the kind of practices and values that they use in fish ponds as well. Yeah, and if you want to talk to more. No, I think um, thanks for bringing up the Indigenous Aquaculture Hub because um, one thing yeah. is that for, for any of you who are familiar with the crazy climate changes that have happened in the Pacific Northwest with, you know, clam guard, clams and other invertebrates just being totally wiped out, um, that has really served as a kind of like a, a bookmark for, for the Hui Malama local Ia, as in, you know, these folks have, you know, they have tribal governance. They have, you know, resource management, they have their own kind of like infrastructure to manage. And yet they are still, you know, there's there's issues. They're also choosing to go different pathways. Um, I think it's not just the Pacific Northwest, but you know, um Maori, the Maori have also done a lot of what would be considered more conventional kind of aquaculture. And I think that um, as I said, I you know, it's one thing that I have learned from the Hui Malama Loko Ia is that there's a lot of flexibility of thought. And if the if the bottom line desire is to feed ourselves, um, there's a lot of flexibility in thinking about what might be some of the possibilities. And having said that, there's still a lot of cognizance around pollution and all of those issues. And um, but I think I think it's it's really interesting to see that that they are willing to be very adaptive, but and yet still stand strong in a lot of their um, ancestral values. Let's get our other question in the room here, and then I think we'd better wrap it up after that. Go okay. ahead, please. Yeah, hi, Rosie. It's nice, nice to see you. this talk. It's really great to learn about the, the bottom-up approach in this event. And my, my question is, I'm wondering, across the statewide network um, of fishbone practitioners, did you see, I'm, I'm imagining there's a lot of, is it not working? Okay. Um, I'm imagining that there is a lot of um, kind of shared needs um, when it comes to adaptation approaches, but I could also imagine, I'm wondering if there were any differences in terms of, for example, like maybe a fish pond fed by like springs might not have as much water quality issues as a fish pond fed by streams. And so I was wondering if there were like a lot of differences in terms of um, local needs and then how you navigate it kind of setting priorities yeah. on a statewide level? The answer in a nutshell is um, definitely yes. It was really interesting. One um, facet or one kind of, yeah, one facet that we explored was the impact of sea level rise on these different types of fish ponds. So you can imagine a fish pond like Heia, which has a wall. I mean, it's like, what are they going to do? Are they going to build the wall higher? And in fact, there are small pilot projects ongoing to see what does that look like? Is it something where the maintenance of that would be just like too onerous because it's going to keep falling in? Um, 
we also took sea level rise projections and shared that with other local like local white opai, which are ankyline ponds. And there it's surprisingly a little bit more positive where the idea is that there might be more new ankyline ponds that form as a result of sea level rise because the water table is shifting. And so it was very interesting to see how by applying this one, I guess you could call it a climate stress because it's kind of like it's this like slow um, change that different um, fish pond types and um, in different locations were exploring different kind of things. And even for the wall, for the, these walled fish ponds, and for example, Heia, we've had conversations between um, the fish pond practitioners, Pai Pai Oheia, and the taro farm across the street, Kako'o Ivi, because as you know, if the salt water is going to go in inland, um, some of they're going to lose taro land. And so there is a little bit of a conversation of like, oh, so what? Maybe the fish pond is going to like extend backwards into the wetland a little bit and not being afraid of having that conversation. I think that's, I don't know, I, 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 keep, I keep being surprised at how like, unafraid and adaptable the fish pond practitioners are and it's not like oh my god we're gonna lose it it's more like okay well now we're gonna be growing fish over there and maybe we have to change the type of species you know so it's really practical and very pragmatic um yeah and so the answer is yes and so we, we did see that we have it i think because what i would like to see is more operationalized you know to operationalize this and implement you know, some of the things we haven't yet seen that a lot of the reason why we haven't seen that, as you can see, our last meeting was in 2019 due to COVID. Um, we haven't been able to kind of like go out and actualize a lot of the plan, but that's kind of what, you know, us sharing this information is, is, is with the hopes that we can begin to right now start kind of um, seeing those changes and, and kind of act on that. But yeah. All right, well, we're at the hour. Please join me again. Thank you, Rosie and Katie. Um, I ask you all to please join us again uh, for our next uh, podcast, uh, Slice of Podcast seminar next month. That'll be Tuesday, December 5th at noon again. Uh, this time we'll have Dr. Joe Gens and his podcast graduate scholars, Gerilyn and Shania, uh, joining us. Uh, they're with the Department of Anthropology at UH Hilo. So looking forward to that talk on using oral histories of Marshallese and Yappies voyaging to develop sustainable sea transport. Uh, folks online, um, a survey will pop up when you log off. Please, if you have any great ideas, suggestions for future seminars, please add them in there. Um, and folks that are here, if you can stick around, um, want some pumpkin pie that Rachel has prepared, please join us. Thank you all for being here.